so yeah, uh, so for the, like chapter three for this part, we're just going to kind of loosely talk about what what like. I think generally why why it was a like why it was a success and what we think kind of made it a success as well. So I've just got a couple of things that we just kind of go through. So like I said earlier, the punk rock the punk rock ethos combined with it, it was like a promotion set by fans, essentially for the fans. Probably was like a big reason why it's a success. The mentality of the owners booking matches that they want to see clearly obviously translated well, which is why they kept getting people in and had to go to bigger venues. Um, and again, I think it was quite. I think they were kind of, I don't necessarily think they were one of the first, but they were one of the sort of main promotions to kind of predominantly use music venues to kind of keep with that sort of punk ethos as well. And I think that kind of helped give it, I'd kind of describe it a bit of an underground feeling, which also would have added, the, added to the appeal. Like it felt like it was some kind of great, seek, like great kept secret, although despite the fact that it had a lot of eyes on the product, if you kind of understand what I mean. Yeah, no, I get that. It's, um, you, people always talk, I think I feel like maybe this conversation has died down a tiny bit, but people mm -hmm. always say shit like you bring back the attitude era, bring back, um, you know, punk rock wrestling like this. And it, it both brought it back without being, it was a homage in a sense to that kind of wrestling without being that kind of wrestling. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, it's very much just modern strong style wrestling yet still was able to keep that feel mm -hmm. of wrestling that i grew up on and that you grew up on and and that i am going to go out on a limb and assume that pretty much most of their fan base love and grew up on yeah i'd, I'd say so I, I think i think you're right it, it was essentially strong style wrestling with a bit of a edgy cotton to it that's how i describe it like if you went there you pretty much did to see some like solid wrestling matches, but then there was just the kind of the feeling around it and the, the way they packaged it that kind of gave it its own kind of unique feeling to it. So I, yeah, I 100% agree on that one, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> uh, what I've also got as well, uh, I kind of put this as well, I, I, I always felt like it, it felt very welcoming as well. So like a common issue that I find with a lot of wrestling in general is that in particular because of the fandom, it can feel a bit uh sort of territorial and gatekeeper-ish you know what i mean like but this promotion generally felt like anyone was welcome i mean one of their taglines was everybody welcome and generally when you would go there you have a good time although you would still encounter those sort of dickhead fans in attendance but then typically i'd say a lot of interactions i had with fans of the show were pretty pleasant did you ever have any sort of particular fan interactions at the progress show that you thought was good or maybe it was bad um i remember i was at the bar once and I thought I was talking to you because uh, <laughs> there was just because there was just a, fr a friendly, a friendly taller man there, and I, 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 I then was just just chatting to this guy for the whole time. Very lovely. Um, most people lovely, even the wrestlers at the merch table. They, even even when you piss them off asking for someone else's merch, pretty lovely. Yeah. Um, th like you say there have been times where we've been at a show and fans haven't been and that's always going to be the case yeah uh um, very more well, outside I'd... of so i think i think the big thing that like the one time i, I really got pissed off as fans was when we were at the progress show at ali pally and uh, generally for the most part like because because for the most part we're just sitting in seats for that one as well so it's not like the typical ballroom where you're in like you can stand and you can kind of maneuver about you've got your own alec you've got your own when you find a seat you're just kind of there mm -hmm. and, and the people around us were just kind of gradually getting more and more annoying and what really tipped over the edge is when it was the miko satnamora match who like an absolute legend of a women's wrestler mm -hmm. and it got yeah the fan the people around us would, rather than just enjoying the match, decided it'd be fun to just chant random wrestler names, like, you know, obscure ones like just Perry Satin or Scott Steiner during the match. And I was just, I think I turned to you and I just said, I remember when I used to be a virgin. Yeah, I remember it too, like it was yesterday. Back in the day. Um. Yeah, I mean, there have been some people that just don't really get, because it's, it's theatre, right? When I go and yeah. see... I, I've, I went to go and see a lot of theatre when I was doing drama and performance at university. Um, I wouldn't yell out other actors' names during the show. If I don't like a match, like, you, you're, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a weird thing. It's because it's such like... Because, yeah, you're welcome to boo if it's 
if if it's some fucking bullshit. Yeah, but, like, exactly. This wasn't some fucking bullshit. This was just the one of the best women's wrestlers of all time uh, putting on a pretty decent match. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We, you, we've had like other people like that. It, it's it's a it's a weird line where it's an, it's a crowd of people who, when if you chant something like "If you hate Gibson, take your shoes off," right? Yeah. You'll take everyone will take their shoe off because we hate Gibson. But it's also <laughs> the kind of like it's it's so it's such a weird mix of boisterous and not boisterous you know yeah it's like a, it's like a football crowd that isn't going to go out when they're t when let's say uh cck loses we're not going to go outside and smash up a car and then you know <laughs> yeah yeah um but yeah there have been some some awkward people here and there of course. Well, no, it's like, it's like we've said before when we had a big discussion about fans. Like, progress wrestling fans at the show are generally some of the funniest and, like, most rabid fans ever. It's a bit like, I guess, like the ECW fan base back in the 90s. You know, they were, they, they're very diehard people. But generally, like, you go there in the crowd, some of the best you'll be amongst. And thankfully for that incident with that one fan, just clearly afraid of the female wrestlers. He, he was like, I think it was only him and maybe one or two other people were joining in with it, and thankfully the rest were just kind of like, what are you doing, dickhead? You know, yeah. I think for the most part, the fans are pretty cool, and it's like you say, I think obviously there's that argument of like, well, I've bought a ticket, I'll chant what I want, and it's like, well, fair enough, but it's like a gobbian reason. If you've just been a deliberate dickhead just because you don't like women's wrestling, then just shut the fuck up. So yeah. it's like, if, if you don't like a match, that's fair enough, but like, don't try and ruin it for the people who are enjoying it. Like, if you hate, go at the bar, go at the merch stand, go, go somewhere else, you know what I mean? If I buy a video game that I don't like, for example, I didn't enjoy Cyberpunk because it was buggy, I don't yeah. open my window and just start yelling at passers-by. Because uh, <laughs> there's just no point. Because they're yeah. not the fucking devs. Um, I mean, I guess it wasn't as bad as that one WWE house show I went to, where the guy sat next to me shot himself and had to leave that was pretty rough what? uh it was yeah me harry and alex went to mm. a show um and there, there was this, there was this guy with his um I, I assume it was his mother or something mm. and he just how old was he? just uh probably like mid-20s or something like that um yeah he definitely had to well he left before the main event anyway so uh, and then the smell left so yeah bear with me M mute me for one second yeah sure Ooh. hey lucy are you still in the chat <laughs> I'm trying to think if there actually is any more awkward interactions I think I think we kind of covered the main one at the merch stand. That was uh, fucking horrible. <laughs> Yay! How are you? Hello, 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 hello. Hello, hello. He's Sorry, back. Sorry, my my grandmother is on the parish council, and um, I am Zoom tech support, so I might be called ah, to help again. No come problem. On, come on. <laughs> we're good. We're good. We've got we've got Lucy in the chat asking how we are. You know, surviving. I'm surviving. Better than being at a house show where a guy shot himself. Although Samoa Joe did come out just after that. So I was fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of carrying on then with... Uh, kind of going back, I guess, to the overall presentation of the show. One thing that I always love for it, I think what drew me in is just the way they kind of... What's a market? It's obviously the logo itself, like the eagle that immediately drew me. And like, I think I think there's something to be said. Like a lot of um, indie promotions really don't put the effort into sort of the branding. Like a lot of them just use very quite generic stuff, and it just doesn't stand out. Whereas, fair enough. Like a lot of people have said, progress is logo can have a lot of connotations to like very bad imagery. And I can I can see that kind of representation, but at least it's bold and it stands out. And then I also just like the way that they. It's just a fun little in joke of like with, with a chapter name, it's got some kind of daft reference to it. So I kind of wrote down a few of my favorite ones. So chapter 16, very, very breaky, breaky, bishy, bishy. <laughs> chapter mm -hmm. 21, you know, we don't like to use the sit down gun. Uh, this next one might be my favorite. Chapter 35, writing Nirvana on other people's bags. Uh, tied with this one's brilliant. Chapter 67, bourbon is also a biscuit. That was when they ran a show in New Orleans at the same weekend as a WrestleMania. And chapter 84, and I think I was at the show, 
a scored beef. Have anybody got a bottle of orange doors? Do you know what reference that's from? No. Lucy, do you know what reference that's from? She might take a while to respond. It's a uh, League of Gentlemen. Oh, what the the Sean Connery one? No, the the comedy series League of Gentlemen. Oh. And what am I thinking of? Is that League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You never watched oh. League of Gentlemen? No. Get get on it, man. What are you nah, doing? No, <laughs> I was more of like a sketch comedy type of guy. I was like a Harry and Paul type thing. I was like a Mitchell and Webb. Nah, fair enough. Well, Mitchell and Webb's sick, to be fair. Oh, Lu Lucy knew it. Bam. Um, yeah, so um, any kind of particular chapter names that stood out to you? What was the... I mean, they did the Simpsons one, Old Man Yells at Cloud, right? Yes, that one's brilliant because I had a double meaning behind it. I totally forgot about that one. Well done. Um, so before, the reason why they named the show after that is because it followed comments from typical Jim Cornette. Um, he, I think he, I think initially he praised what progress was, but then he said that it was something about the way Jim Smallman dressed that he should be killed for it. It was quite brutal, yeah. So in response, they called it All Man Yells a Cloud, which is also a reference to Simpsons, but also a reference to the fact that Jim Cornette is very much an old man these days yelling at clouds. Mm -hmm. So very, very fun on the nose reference. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably my... Uh... My favorite one. Were they were they the running through fields of wheat one? Or that might I think Lucha Forever actually tried to do things like that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got the it's name a very British ones. thing making it a yeah. A I was trying meme. to think. Were Progress kind of the first to kind of go with the sort of weird names for pay per views or what, what shows rather than pay per views? Or like, was there an instance of other shows doing it before them? I'm not sure where that originated from. Mm. I'd assume it probably just comes from them having a comedy background, yeah, uh, stand-up background, things like that. Because that's always, that's just kind of like you know, what they'd go with. Um, yeah. So, Loser Forever had a show called uh, Never Touch Another Man's Umbrella, which I think was a Marty Skull at the time one. Yeah. Um, oh, it's looking at a poster here with Joey Ryan and Marty Skull on it. Uh, <sighs> Which is something mania. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. They they had uh, running through a, running through a wheat field. As oh. a show name. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like it's a very British thing. Yeah, I wouldn't Couldn't... be surprised if a lot of just indie shows in America do the same. Um, I know that things like bar wrestling used to. Oh, they used to do it, yeah. Because um, North Wrestling, which is my now no like local promotion, where I hope they come back after the pandemic. They do, they do the kind of same thing with naming their shows, so it's like a reference to kind of like a song or a film, TV, whatever. <clears throat> and Progress just kind of really took that to the next level with some of them because some of them are very deep cut references. But like for a guy like me who loves like very deep cut references, that again was one of the things that sort of enamored me to them as a company. Like they're willing to have a bit of fun with just naming it. Like again, because like a lot of indie promotions will just take like the naming of a show too seriously. But even then, it's like it. Like I've I've tried before. It's really hard to come up with a cool sounding name for like a pay per view or a show. Like a that cool one, or done. like a, a... <laughs> by cool one? Do you mean like vengeance? And... Yeah, you know, like one that would be typical Tuesday. WWE main level stock. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that, that's one thing I feel. As much as we love AW, I feel like there main pay-per-view show names are a bit lacking with double or nothing being the exception because that's like a really cool reference to where they came from i mean they're pretty generic just you know revolution or whatever and they, they do some classics they've done like bash, bash at the beach yeah things like that uh honestly maybe nxt has it the, the best where they can just say things like well new year's evil was really good i like the i like that one uh, obviously they brought back halloween havoc um yeah. but it's usually just takeover brooklyn three yeah uh they done what take over blackpool two um maybe that's the best way to name something if you were to name a progress show what what would it be Ch let's say chapter 150 four hmm that is a good question really throwing you on the spot here yeah you are bastard 
You're better at this improv at me, so what like you've probably got something already in your head. Right? Um uh, uh I'd probably make it like a social distance type deal uh, or, or something. Um and I'd probably just call it like a chapter 150 herd immunity. Um <laughs> and I'd have I'd have a uh no touching uh, a socially distanced uh rumble match or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a socially licensed uh, lumberjack match, uh, and like a, uh, and not a bra and panties match, a PPE mm -hmm. match, <laughs> where it's just like um, people dressed in like full like garb, like like visor, like CDC uh, hazmat suits, and it's the first wrestler to just like have it all ripped off, mm. gets the virus, <laughs> I, I guess. I guess that's where that leads, and they get right. written off. To you. I, I haven't really thought it too far through, to be honest uh, with you. Yeah, clearly, <laughs> hand sanitizer on a pole match. Mm. There you go. I think I think I've got it. So if if they ever did a show in Newcastle again, I'd want them to try and pull out a reference to Alveda Sin Pet. And I think the funny the funniest one I can come to mind is has that bastard given in yet, Dennis? I don't know. I'm not northern Deep enough. Deep <laughs> I'm not northern enough. I don't know. <laughs> this is just sometimes being Jace will say things and it'll just be like an error screen across your face. It's I just get like completely cross eyed. No idea what's going on. <laughs> Outnumbered, mate. Um I, I think we've already touched upon it a little bit, but um it's it probably deserves to be said. I think again, part of the success and the reason why it's so big is because they just had some of the biggest names, like either they helped establish them, or it was just the fact like they just came through from other promotions. So when you just look at just a few of the names, I mean, the fact like, you know, Pete Dunn, Tyler Bate, Will Ospreay, Vault, Zach Gibson, and Tony Storm all kind of cut their teeth in progress as well as other promotions. Um, I mean, Pete Dunn was the one who set up Attack with, uh, I think it was Mark Andrews. Um, but then it's also the fact that you've got quite big international names from the American indie scene as well at the time. So people like Matt Riddle, Keith Lee, Tommaso Ciampa. Finn Balor came through when he was Prince Devitt. They had Adam Cole and they even got managed to get Samoa Joe. Um, I think it's a little wonder the, pro like the promotion did so well. Uh, obviously, a lot of it was they grew the talent, but then the fact like that talent is now some of the biggest names on NXT and WWE kind of speaks a lot for them as well. I think it's kind of synergistic uh, in that regard, mm -hmm. where it's like they had these talents go when NXT UK was forming and they did the... Um, Back before NXT UK was a thing, and they did the United Kingdom Championship um, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had these wrestlers going back to progress with the belts, and it was this kind of like, you know, with each other. You, you'd go there because the um, the UK champion was there, and then you'd go and watch WWE because the, you know, he was then there it's mm. yeah it, it was it was synergistic in a sense um and they've still been able to have like a, a fair few big names now that they have that kind of more of a working relationship um, yeah is that a good thing overall who knows who knows i mean i think it serves well i think i think what's kind of good about it is that it's not like they're trying to overload their card with people just because they can get access to them. You know what I mean? It, it's like, so for example, when they last did Super Strong Style, um, they managed to get Kyle O'Reilly and uh, Cameron Grimes, who was still going by Trevor Lee at the time, and they were both under NXT contract. Um, Kyle O'Reilly was probably like a, an example where they got a big name that wasn't to the point where it was like them trying to like totally flaunt the fact that they've got these WWE connections, if that makes sense. Because he was still mostly just, uh, he, he wasn't at the level he's at now where Kyle O'Reilly's kind of be, being positioned as being the like the new main event or in NXT, he was still just part of the undisputed era puzzle. He was mainly just part of the tag team bit, but it's still it's still like enough just to show that they can get the names, but it's not like they're going to just overload the card with the fact like they could get NXT talent if that makes sense. It, you know, it, it's kind of like if I went to a progress show, I almost don't want a mega star coming out. Yeah, my, my tiny child, but my tiny child, my tiny child brain. Uh, <laughs> It goes, goes. Oh, wouldn't it be so great if the Undertaker came out to fight uh, OJMO? That would but just be a bit too above the. Maybe, like... maybe it's a bit much. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. I, I'd be like, wow, that was cool. 
Are there still three more matches? <laughs> um, but no, j- just having like having these names come out is is always fun. Yeah, and it, it's not like they did it every show. Like I think for something like Super Strong Style, you can you can understand why they would try and get like one or two big names from the NXT brand because it's obviously that's their kind of biggest show that they do. Uh, which we'll get in, actually we'll transition to that now. Then so obviously carrying on from that, it's like how the promotion. It wasn't just like the fact it was just a promotion that just had a general card each time. Like they did have some special one-off things. Obviously, Super Strong Style 16 we mentioned there. So it's like a three-day tournament with plenty of other matches on the card. I'd say it's like the closest thing you could get to where it's like a wrestling event that's equivalent to a music festival. If that kind of makes sense. I get you. It's like three days and you've got like at least a good three, four-hour show each day. So like you're going to clearly have a lot of fun. It's just trying not to get into too much trouble leaving the venue when you're absolutely smashed and have to go back the next day, which I would typically do on many occasions. There's something about wrestling shows where I'll start off fine and by the end of the show, I'm absolutely tanked. I think my first progress show back, I ended up throwing up outside of the Web Spoons in Camden because I was absolutely fucked. It, 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 there is a point where you go a little bit more quiet and you, you do kind of sway a bit more. <laughs> Which must be a bit weird for you, given you're not much of a drinker, and yeah, um, they're just like throwing it back. <laughs> well, my my entire because uh, if we don't have a seat when we go to progress, my entire thing is just like trying to get a foot. Because like, you know, you're you're over here towering over everyone, and I'm just kind of like, you should just put me <laughs> on your shoulders, to be honest, because I can't see most of the time. <laughs> Would you really trust that after about five pints, though? You'll swear um, with me. They'll just be like, oh, steady. I don't know. Uh, maybe if I had like, if I if if I could be, you know, you know, like a like a beer helmet that's like slowly drip feeding you. If I yeah. could be in control of that, and I could like slowly, like if it, if I'm swaying a bit too much, I like cut off the pipe, and I'm like, I'm like, nah, you had enough. And when the swaying stops, I'm like, yeah, get one then. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Um, other stuff, so we did mention this a bit earlier before as well as their National Progression Tournament. Uh, so this is obviously a much shorter tournament compared to Super, Super Strong Style 16. But what's great about it is that it's kind of their way of not only spotlighting new talent they've got in, but it's a way of them of introducing new blood to the roster as well. Um, I mean, just look at not the tournament they've just had the one before. That's how they got Cara Noir into the company. And now within a short couple of months, he was their champion. So... It's kind of like a big thing that that tournament can do well for getting them new new talent, and it's quite a unique way of introducing the new talent. I think. Yeah, uh, they should always do things like this. It's it's the closest you get to New Japan's Young Lion thing, you know, bringing people up uh, from sort of humble beginnings uh, yeah. and and forming them into something. Um, WWE. I'm trying to think of something that's close to this. Well, their main product isn't anything like a, a developmental thing. NXT is no longer a developmental thing. Yeah. And even in its, even in its roots, it hardly was. When it was a, when it, it was more of a developmental thing when it was practically a fucking game show, you know? By yeah. the time <laughs> by the time it became something with a, a belt and you know, it had like you know Bo Dallas and and you know your your Tyler Blacks, Seth Rollins, and whatnot. It was kind of already like, yeah, these guys had come through FCW. These guys had come from uh, Ohio Valley wrestling, um, mm-hmm. wherever. Um, I don't know. Does NXT doesn't really have any kind of? I suppose we will mention this later, but obviously, Progress and various of the Indies are basically in partnership with WWE and have been for like the last couple of years. I suppose that is their sort of feeder system now, probably is a bit more than NXT. That's where they're really sort of finding the talent that they want. And really, realistically, NXT is fair enough it's its own brand now, but it's still pretty much the place where a lot of them will go just to kind of learn the WWE way of things. Right. One of the newest signings to NXT is Eli Drake. Yes. Oh, Although LA he's... Knight. Right? That's always the weird thing about it, is they take people who are already fairly well established at this point, but will put them in NXT still. Well, it's exactly why NXT is no longer a developmental brand of any kind. Yeah. I guess that I guess that completely died 
when it became a, a show. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like when they put Bala back on it and they did all this kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's it's strange. Maybe even the closest thing you have to a developmental show anymore is just NXT UK, and even then, it's, you know, here and there, yeah. they what? Who the most recent signing? They had Ben Carter, who now oh, goes got... by a different name. They changed his name yeah. already. Fucking hell, uh, Miko. But again, it's it's already been established. She's strictly there more for helping them train, and is going to be somewhat of an on on air talent. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, if we're talking about younger talents, I don't think she doesn't really count. No. Um, <laughs> uh, but if they do let her be a, a more of a developmental role and help people, that's that's one of the best fucking gets you could ever get. Oh, the match um, she had with Kaylee Ray just kind of showed the role she's going to fill. It was an absolutely brilliant match, and again, it's just there to help people like Kelly Ray, who's already kind of a veteran of the scene from the Indies anyway, just get them even more prepared for when they'll probably inevitably, like she'll probably be one of the people to even go to NXT next or even just go straight to the main roster. Because it seems like, um, as a little side thing, it looks like Walt has got a big announcement, uh, which would be tomorrow, I think they do it, Thursdays. And a lot of people seem to think he's either going to be going to NXT now. I doubt he's going to go to the main roster because I think he's already said he doesn't want to go to work for the main roster. A little surprised he's going to NXT because apparently he's very happy just staying in Europe. So I don't know. I think it's more I healthy. think it I think it's because of the pandemic. I don't think he wants to do a house circuit. Mm-hmm. I believe that's the case. He doesn't want to do that kind of schedule. And yeah, yeah it kind of ruins the uh it kind of it somewhat ruins a talent like that, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, other shows that they do that are really unique and interesting, uh, Unboxing Live. So this is obviously kind of a funny nod to the sort of unboxing culture on YouTube, where typically it's just the total surprise card. Like, they won't really announce who's going to be on it beforehand. Um, often this is kind of a, yeah, another way of them to maybe introduce someone debuting for the promotion. Usually someone who's actually a bit more established. It's not really someone new. Or it's like having previous stars return. So that's quite a unique one. Um, I'm pretty sure you came to one of the shows with me, so I think one of the, my favorite things to do is the throwback shows. So, so far they've only done two of them, and it was a show where they did a throwback to both the 70s and they did didn't have one at the 80s. And typically they'll go the whole mile of this, so in terms of the presentation, they make it look a bit retro, and they'll even have the wrestlers come out adopting uh, hilarious themed gimmicks. We definitely went to the 80s one, didn't we? Yes. Um, yes. The best match was Doctor Who against Marty McFly. Yes. Uh where I believe the Doctor lost and then got in the TARDIS, went back in time, and then won. Yeah, yeah. Which was, was tremendous. Um, it was um, Chris Brooks as Doctor Who, and I can't remember who was... I th- I'm pretty sure it was Mike Bailey. I think it was people. Mike Bailey. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I might be... No, no. Callum... Something. No, I'm, I can't remember. I, no. I won't... No, I can't remember. The, the, I mean, the whole thing, like, obviously there's a few that's, that you remember, but then the fact, like, a lot of them do go the extra mile for that gimmick, it kind of, like, if it's kind of hard to put the face to it, you know what I mean? Because they do, mm. they let them one out. I mean, obviously the other standout was Paul Robinson coming out as Dirty Dancing. And, like, oh. he basically broke character that, like, he was, he was in that character breaking his usual tough guy routine until the very end when he broke it ever so slightly and then went back into the... 80s character <laughs> who okay i know, remember that it was um dunkzilla as uh wally and who yes, else was yeah. it who was the who was he against uh was, was, it, against. was it possibly dan maloney so as the iron sheik as the iron sheik yeah yes it was, it, the, was. it was the iron no it was the teflon sheik against uh wally from where's wally that was it yes. and 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 he would just he would just leave the ring and then he'd go and sit in the crowd. Uh, and then and then the Teflon Sheik would just go and search for him. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I've just remembered, I completely forgot about this match, the, the best match on it. And I remember seeing it announced beforehand. And mm. I, it was it was Ilya Dragunov against Sugar Duncan, I think it was. Yes. And I was, looking at, I, was, I was looking at thinking, okay, so I'm not going to do it. They're going to make Ilya go very Drago from Rocky Four, And uh-huh. Sugar Duncan is going to go very American. But what they did instead was they made Sugar Duncan in be the Russian baddie in that match and make Elia be the American hero. So I thought that's yeah. actually brilliant. They kind of great. subverted the expectation on that one. It was tremendous. 
Um, I think, yeah, that was the last of the kind of the most interesting shows. But yeah, it just kind of shows that they are willing to not only put on some really good wrestling shows, but they're also willing to have poke a bit of fun at themselves as well with those kind of throwback things and even unboxing. Uh, the only thing I kind of wouldn't kind of bring to life, which I think made it unique, is again, although they would have your typical belts, such as the world, the tag, and the women's, they kind of went out of the box with the titles as well. So the only other two that you ever had, but again, it kind of shows that they were trying to do something a bit different, was they had the Atlas Division title, which was just the opposite of a cruiserweight title. So it mostly championed big men rather than sort of the sort of faster lightweight. And then there's the Proteus Division title, which was a brilliant belt, which they still have at the moment, but it's going to be interesting to see if they bring it back. So that one was essentially where the person who had the belt got to pick the rules of the match. So to date, only Paul Robinson has been the holder. And for example, his rules were if you want to win the belt, you had to either make him submit or knock him out. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's it's all gimmick stuff, but mm -hmm. but it's 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 not it, like it works there. Um, it's not like gimmick, say like the the hardcore belt and DDT where it becomes right. a bit of a joke on the twenty four seven. Like at least it's something you can really get behind. Like um, again with the Proteus one, like they did say like a bit jokingly, like if you want to defend it, you could do it in a dance off if you wanted to. Like so right. I, in, in my head it's a serious belt where someone like Paul obviously established it a serious where you had to because the matches he had defending it were very brutal. Because yeah. obviously you got to knock him out and tap out. But then there is the element there for them to have a bit more of a light hearted thing if one person had it and was like you've got to like again win, win a dance off to win the belt. So it kind of doesn't it toes the line i'd say it's not like ridiculously gimmicky but it's also like quite serious well progress is one of the i think any good wrestling company is able to to put on a variety show where you can have a 60 minute classic that has been built up over five years and people end up crying at the end of it mm -hmm. and then just before that you can put on a match with doctor who and marty mcfly you know um yeah. i think any decent wrestling show can recognize that they're a variety show and do that and mm. progress can do that and do do that like we watched the battle royale where vacant came out yeah exactly you know and then we yeah. had the main event which was you know a tremendous main event very emotional um and you know what we don't do as progress wrestling fans we don't go we don't go oh that was completely unbelievable it's like none of it's really it's wrestling grow up yeah yeah uh, exactly but yeah no they with that championship and like you say you can have someone come in and then be like we're gonna do uh a, a three rounds wrestling match like they do in nxt uk for like the heritage cup with yeah. uh and we're gonna do it like based on score and whatever that's how you beat me for this one and then the person that beats him can go um all right all of my matches are 10 seconds long and we'll do yeah. it blindfolded or whatever yeah and and that that will make a great as long as i mean i guess even in progress you could make that main event you probably wouldn't but but you know well, it, I think it allows would. just for just for variety and and fun i think they would i, th I think that's something i could add i mean because like this is the thing like since it's come back which we're gonna live right now they've only just got the world championship as the only belt on the show so it's gonna be we'll talk about that more later but i hope i hope they bring back the proteus belt i can kind of kind of understand why they might not which again we'll get onto a bit later um but yeah I, I think as well what's good about them is it's not like your match card isn't your stereotypical one which which we kind of champion so it's like they would quite happily put something like a cruiserweight match in the main event Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean, it, it, it's not always the situation where it has to be like a big man or a world championship match in the main event. They'll typically, if there's a big feud they've got going in another division, they'll put that as the main event. Like a lot of tag team matches have been in the main event for the belts and things like that. So they're, they're always willing to like give a card that is a bit mixed. It's not always going to be like a very regimented thing. Um, is there anything else you want to kind of add to like why you liked it or why you think it was uh, a success? I think it's just the willingness to be a bit outside the box. Uh, the wrestlers clearly enjoy what they do. Yeah. I assume there's quite a lot of creative control and just allowing wrestlers to do and be who they are. Um, then it shows, you know, when, when it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but it, it all pretty much always fucking works. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, to get, I feel like to even get to the progress point, to the point of progress where you can progress to progress you you've probably <laughs> already established yourself as someone who can either go on the mic go in the ring or do both um 
and yeah uh, it's it's worked so far however mm. there have been some hiccups as we will get on to 